Y nos fuimos, son las 6 y 7, así que con eso podemos comenzar. Este, pues gracias a todos por estar aquí, obviamente. Mi nombre es Amanda Prieto, yo soy la fundadora y directora ejecutiva de lo que es Amando Océano. Amando Océano pues, tiene como misión eh, promover la acción de preservar nuestros ecosistemas marinos. Nos llamamos Amando Océano como un juego de unas palabras que pues, eh, se refieren a amar el océano, ya que nos gusta inspirar amor sobre el océano y su ecosistema. Eh, nos pueden seguir en las redes sociales, tenemos Instagram, Facebook, Twitter y YouTube. Eh, nos gusta tener esta charla así virtuales regularmente, pues obviamente son virtuales debido al COVID, pero sí nos han traído cosas positivas, ya que tenemos a personas de, de otros países. Este, y estamos aquí hoy con Dr. Stacey Williams, que es una... Ay, disculpa. Este... Hoy tenemos a, a la doctora Stacy Williams, que este, Stacy, te agradecemos un millón por estar aquí. Nosotros en Amando Océano personalmente llevamos ya varios años siguiendo a ICER, así que es un orgullo tenerlos aquí. Este, y yo creo que con eso podemos comenzar. Y gracias a todos por estar aquí. Gracias, Amanda. Um, Buenas noches a todos. Uh, voy a presentar en inglés, pero yo puedo contestar tus preguntas en español, um, pero estoy mucho más como uh, hablando en inglés, um, so lo siento, pero um, my name is Stacy Williams. Um, I'm a co-founder of a nonprofit organization here in Puerto Rico um, called the Institute for Socio-Ecological Research. Um, I'm also a co-founder of a for-profit um, called Coastal Survey Solutions. But today, or tonight, I'm going to be talking about uh, some restoration projects um, that we've been carrying out with um, the Institute for Socio-Ecologic Research, also known as ESER Caribe. Um, so tonight, I'm going to be talking about um, some alternatives, different approaches to uh, restoring coral reefs. Um, by integrating other functionally important organisms um, like sea urchins and other herbivores. Okay, um, so there are three main restoration projects right now that we are running under ESER. Um, we have a land-based coral nursery. Uh, this is the first land-based coral nursery in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is located at the Department of Marine Science um, in La Perguera. Um, I don't really have time to speak about of that tonight, but maybe um, I can speak about the land-based nursery um, some other night um, and give another presentation. Tonight, I would like to focus on the two other restoration projects uh, that we have. Um, that's the diadema restoration project, the uh, long spine sea urchin, as you see in the middle of the screen. And then we have a new project um, where we are larval rearing another species, a sea urchin, uh, called the Tripnustes ventricosas. This is the West Indian sea egg. So as many of you know, the um, coral reefs are changing throughout the world, um, especially here in the Caribbean. Um, uh, coral reefs used to be dominated by corals. Um, that's what gives their name. Um, but since the early 1980s up until now, we've been seeing um, episodic events um, starting from the early 80s with the die off of diadema um, that I will talk about later on in the presentation. And now more recently is the stony coral tissue loss disease um, that is affecting uh, the stony corals, uh, corals around Puerto Rico. Um, so with all these disturbances, we have been seeing a drastic decline in coral cover um, throughout Puerto Rico and throughout the Caribbean. So reefs that were once dominated by corals are now um, looking like uh, reefs of algae. Um, and this is a video. Uh, if you've shallowed any, I mean, if you snorkel in any shallow uh, reefs, um, this is a, a common sight. Um, you know, dead coral heads covered in macroalgae, fleshy macroalgae like Dictyota. Um, here's some picture of uh, Calerpa. So these reefs, um, at, and as you see, look dirty. Um, so if we wanted to do any type of coral restoration and put in outplant corals on this coral head per se, 
it would not be a good idea um, because most likely the, the algae would smother um, the small corals. Another problem that we have, um, and this is um, um, what we are seeing a lot in the East Coast, uh, like in Fajardo and Culebron Vieques, is this encrusting algae called Ramicrusta. Uh, this is an apacinalid, um, and it grows quickly and it can overgrow and smother live coral tissue. If you see in the the pictures to the right of your screen, you can see that Rami Crusta is overgrowing uh, the live tissue of Orbicella annularis. And the bottom picture, I scraped away part of the Rami Crusta, and you could see the actual dead skeleton of um, annularis below the Rami Crusta. Um, so there's a, a, a big problem with algae on most of the reefs um, in Puerto Rico. And if we really want to start uh, restoring the resiliency of these reefs, we have to think of alternatives, how to get rid of this algae, especially Rami Crusta, where I've measured Rami Crusta to be as high as 60% on, uh, on some reefs in the East Coast, and Dictyota, where pretty much it's the same cover um, uh, on South or West, um, West Side coral reefs. So, the, there are organisms that eat algae. Um, we have herbivorous fish like the sur surgeon fish and um, the doctor fish uh, that eat filamentous algae. And we also do have uh, parrotfish. This is a midnight parrot. Um, this is actually in Bonaire. We, I haven't seen a midnight parrotfish here in Puerto Rico. Um, but these Parrotfish are pretty picky. Uh, they do not like dictyota, like the bushy, fleshy macro algae. And so far in the field, I have not seen any scrape marks um, on Rami Crusta. So possibly, you know, if we really want to make a dent into uh, the algal populations on the reefs, um, parrotfish maybe might not be the answer. I'm not saying they're not important because they are important, but if we want to decrease the Kyoto or Rami Crusta, um, we have to think of some alternative herbivores. And that's where sea urchins um, come, come into place. Um, sea urchins like uh, Diadema antelarum and Trypnusis ventricosus and Echinometra varius. So my first, the first project I'm going to be talking about is the Diadema restoration project. Um, so Diadema antelarum, as you see on your screen, this is uh, the black long spine, spine sea urchin. Um, uh, they used to be very common in the Caribbean, um, but there was a mass mortality in the early 80s. Um, and this mass mortality was thought to be due to a waterborne pathogen that started in Panama and traveled throughout the Caribbean. So some of the populations of diadema uh, completely died off, like 100% of their population. And uh, scientists uh, were able to assess uh, the direct impacts of the, the loss of these populations directly after the mortality. And what they found was that uh, there was a significant increase in algal cover up to 250% on some of these reefs. So there was a drastic change immediately after the die-off of this really important sea urchin. Um, the recovery of the sea urchin has been really slow. Um, we see it in patches, uh, mostly in shallow reefs. Um, they're still, the densities are still far below the pre-mass mortality densities. Um, you'll be lucky if you see a couple on a reef. Um, some, like I was diving off of Culebra and this one reef by Tamarindo has amazing population. So you get those little pockets of really high dense, density, uh, density um, uh, high dense uh, urchins in those reefs. Um, but for my dissertation, I actually looked at what could be some of the causes uh, for uh, the low recovery of the sea urchin. And what I observed was that possibly settler and recruit uh, mortality was a bottleneck limiting uh, the recovery of the populations around Puerto Rico. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So I just wanna briefly go over the life history of uh, a sea urchin because I'm gonna be talking a lot about larvae and settlers. So I want you all to understand um, 
what I'm talking about, like the, the life cycle. So the sea urchins have a complex life history, uh, like many marine organisms. Um, the adults release their eggs and sperm in the water column, and the eggs are externally fertilized in the water. Uh, they, they then go through a planktonic stage, and this planktonic stage, they're really small, microscopic. You need a microscope to see them. And depending on the species, um, they are in the water column for so many days. For diadema, um, it is said that they possibly are in the water uh, up to 50 days, which is very long for any marine invertebrate. Um, here are some pictures of an early stage uh, larvae um, and a late, later stage larvae of diadema. So when they're getting to their later stages, um, they will sense where and what habitat and what reef is like the best for them to settle. And that's what we call a settler. So when they have those cues on that reef, they will then metamorphose into a baby settler. And this is what you get. Um, it's a really tiny individual um, and it's usually red in color. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking a lot about settlers. So it's basically the stage from uh, when they transition out of the planktonic stage. And then they, if they survive the settler stage, they grow a little bit larger and they become recruits and recruits are just defined as like what you can see with your naked eye. And then if they survive as recruits, they continue to grow to young adults and adults. So the diadema restoration project um, overall, it, what we're doing is that we're collecting, collecting settlers in the field. So that stage from the, just when they transition out of the planktonic stage to becoming a baby urchin. Um, so we, we collect those settlers, uh, we grow those settlers in the lab until they become young adults. Um, and once they're bigger and hardier, we then um, transport them to the different coral reefs. So the objective of this uh, program is to to boost the populations of diadema where they haven't recovered. Um, the goal is to enhance the reef resiliency, the conditions on the coral reefs, in hopes that this will um, increase uh, coral recruitment or settlement or just coral survivorship or, or other uh, important benthic organisms like sponges. Some of the advantages of this, this project is that we bypass a really difficult stage from rearing the entire life cycle in the lab. So we don't have to spawn urchins. We don't have to grow out the larvae. All we have to do is take the shortcut, go out to the field and collect the settlers. Um, another uh, great advantage of this pro uh, project is that we bypass possibly a bottleneck, a natural predation stage to that we are, we are uh, restocking individuals at a larger size. So the only predators they have to compete or fight against or protect themselves against are fish, um, most likely crabs or um, worms are not going to eat the larger sea urchins. Uh, lastly, we are introducing a new population. We are not taking diadema from a healthy population and then moving them around to another reef. We are completely introducing a new population. So how do we do this? Um, we usually have between 30 to 40 mooring lines at the shelf edge in La Perguera. Um, this is a video um, of, I believe it's myself, collecting the settlement plates. Um, so e on each of these mooring lines, we have a line that has uh, 20 settlement plates. And what we're calling these settlement plates are just astroturf, like the plastic mats that you could find, well, it used to be at Kmart, um, but you could order them online. Um, and there are the 20 plates per line. So in a month collection, we go through 600 plates usually. So the plates are collected um, usually in the summertime because that's when I found that there was a peak in settlement. Uh, the plates are usually collected. We're gonna start early this year because we collected a lot of settlers early on last year. So we'll be start, we will start collecting settlers in May and that will last until till October. So the plates are out there for a month. 
So once we collect the plates, we bring them back and we put them in these blue containers with, um, with air. Um, and then we have um, a bunch of people, usually about six to seven people going through plates um, and picking off the sea urchins. Now these settlers are really small. Uh, their size ranges from 0.4 millimeters to a millimeter in their test diameter. So you can see in the picture to the right, uh, this little red dot is a settler. Um, they usually are red, but they can be black when, once they start growing bigger. So here again, here's it, for reference, my thumb, and here is uh, one of the smaller settlers of diadema. They could even get smaller than this. So at this stage, when they're at, at the really small stage, they're very sensitive. So we have four, or we're now gonna have four systems, but we used, we used to have three systems um, where the first system is for the really small urchins. And the reason for this is that the water is filtered. Um, the water quality is pretty consistent. Uh, there's no changes in salinity or temperature um, and the water is filtered through a UV light. Once they get bigger um, and hardier, we can then move them to some larger tanks to where we, we, would feed, we'll, we will feed them uh, macroalgae. Right now we're feeding them over. Um, once they get a little bit bigger, like what you see in my hand, um, probably a little bit bigger than this, probably the one in the middle, uh, we then move them to tanks outside. And the tanks outside um, are just filtered with like, they have just a sock for sediment, but other than that, um, they do pretty well. Um, we give the, we feed the urchins uh, twice a week um, and we try to feed them a whole array of algae. Right now we're feeding them ulva a lot because we can find um, supply of ulva and one of the gallos in La Perguera. And supposedly it's very nutritious for the urchins. Um, but they like all different types of algae, like, like Laurentia, Paina, Typomorpha, Dictyola. So we try to get them used to what life would be maybe on a reef um, uh, for food. Uh, so the tanks are cleaned. We have to clean these tanks because they do eat a lot um, and do feces. So we have to clean these tanks um, every week. Uh, or every other week, depending on how quick they eat. Uh, so the urchins are in these tanks for about a year. It all depends on the space and how much food you feed them. If you have a lot of urchins in the tank, the diadema will stop growing. Um, you could give them all the algae that you want to give them, but they won't grow bigger. So right now we have actually run out of space and we are moving urchins um, to corrals, to cages, um, next to the docks at Megillas at the Department of Marine Science um, to increase their growth um, to get them ready uh, to then move to the East Coast uh, this year. So once the urchins grow to be uh, size between two to four centimeters in test diameter, so they start about a millimeter and now they're at a two to four centimeter size, um, they are ready to go to the reefs. So this is a map of all the sites that I uh, that we have taken diadema, we three stock to, um, and I'll be talking a little bit of the results um, in in La Perguera and also in Fajardo, and we just um, transferred 500 sea urchins to Fajardo, uh, 250 were restocked to Cayo Largo and 250 were restocked on Palomino. Uh, this year we'll be taking another uh, 1,100, 1,100 sea urchins to Palomino um, and probably the rest are going to La Perguera or somewhere else if needed be. So before uh, we place any sea urchin on the reef, um, we install corrals and these are just cages um, because the diadema love to escape. And if we want to prove that they are eating the algae, um, we need to keep them in a spot. So uh, I hope last year was the last year that I could use corrals. 
Um, I'm hoping I could just take the, coral, the, the urchins to the reefs and release them. Um, but some urchins are placed in these corrals and then the rest are usually released to the, the, the reef, released on the reef. Um, how we measure benthic, the change in benthic substrate is uh, we use these quadrats and uh, some quadrats are fixed. So we use nails to mark. And then we also take uh, photos of, of random quadrats. So we usually have a uh, photo, we usually take six photographs um, of the quadrats per corral. And we usually have six corrals uh, three corrals will have diadema and three corrals will not have diadema and then we have which are controls um, and then we have a, a control outside of the corrals. Um, depending on the size of the corrals, we usually place between 23 to 25. Um, this time around in Fajardo we placed 20 um, and the corral uh, size was about a meter, uh, meter squared. So uh, that's a lot of diadema for an area, but they usually escape. That's why we put so many at first. So we monitor their survivorship. Um, depending on the location, we go back a day after, two days, um, a week, two weeks, one month, and two months after restocking. Um, like for Hardo, we only went one week, two weeks, one month, and two months since it, it's far. I live in Cabo Rojo. Um, and what we do is that we assess how many diadema are inside the corrals and we swim around the reef and try to count the uh, diadema around um, the area. Um, uh, what we I found out in 2016, these diadema will move far. Um, you could find diadema um, as far as 30 meters uh, from the site uh, where you restock. So um, if they don't like the area or if there are a lot of damselfish that are pecking at their spines, um, they will escape and leave the area. So um, that is sometimes an issue, the, the damselfish. So in 2016, that was like the first big uh, restocking event. I took um, 343 diadema to a back reef of Mendia Luna. Um, this back reef is actually a permanent site at the um, of the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program, um, which works out because we have to go there every two years um, to survey the reef conditions. Um, what, what I noticed in 2016 is that during the first two weeks, uh, most of the diadema will escape the corrals or go far off. Um, about a month, they get comfortable on the reef and they present homing behavior. And what homing behavior means is that they usually hide in crevices and holes during the day. And then at night, they go out and feed and they feed uh, an area and then they will return to that same hole. So that is what con is considered homing behavior. So about a month, the diadema uh, really get used to the reef and they the ones that stick around will stick around. Uh, we, I had really high retention um, at Media Luna. It was up to 75%. I still could go back and find a lot of sea urchins at Media Luna. And actually, there's um, natural recruitment at this site uh, of diadema. Um, so the, the densities uh, continually increase at Media Luna, which is uh, great news. Also in Cayo Largo, we had uh, high retention um, this past uh, January um, that we could find 75% of the sea urchins, but retention on many of the reefs uh, ranged between like 30 to 40% of the sea urchins. So we immediately see, uh, once we put out the urchins, we see changes in the benthic structure and they're pretty immediate um, within the first week. Uh, we see less algae um, and a cleaner substrate. Uh, this is in 2016, so after two months, uh, the entire corral, uh, which was four uh, square meters in size, was uh, cleaned of algae. Here's a video of, um, we just removed the corral, so this is two months of having diadema inside the corral. So this is the substrate outside the corral, so this is Dictyota. So this is 
Um, Dictyota is very common at this reef at Medialuna. So this is what the reef typically looks like without diadema. And you're gonna see once I move to where that corral was and where the diadema are, how different the substrate is. Um, so you can see uh, the substrate's much cleaner. Um, there's way less dictyota. Uh, you can see Christus coralline algae, which is a beneficial algae for coral settlement at this site. Um, so you can see that diadema are doing their job in eating algae at this site. Here are some results um, from our restocking in 2018 at Cayo Diablo in Fajardo. Uh, this is just one uh, corral. Uh, so you can see that Rami Crusta, that's the encrusting paisanella that can overgrow and, and kill corals. Uh, that cover in this corral was really high, uh, close to 60%. Uh, what, we're what I'm calling pavement means that it's just clean substrate. So you can see that the cover of clean substrate was really low. And this is before diadema. So once we put the diadema in, you could see with one week, uh, the cover of Rami Cresta goes down, uh, clean substrate increases. Again, one month, two months. And after two months, we saw in this particular uh, corral, we saw a 54% decrease in Rami Cresta in just two months. Um, you can see that there was a significant increase in clean substrate. So here's a picture before uh, diadema was placed um, and the same quadrat, you can see how much cleaner the substrate is. Again, uh, this is El Corral in La Perguera. So this habitat and reef is very different from Cayo Diablo. You can see that Dictyoa and these turf with sediment mats are the dominant substrates at this reef in this one particular corral. So you can see that Dictyoa was high and also turf with sediment, um, but pavement is really, or clean substrate is really low. Same, week, uh, week after, after one week after the diadema, you can see a decrease in the viola and turf with sediment, increase in clean substrate. Again, two weeks, one month, two months. In two months, diadema ate 92% of the dictyola, 84% of the turf with sediment. And you can see that pavement uh, significantly increased um, clean pavement. This picture is a little bit, this reef is always very turbid. Um, there's a lot of uh, suspension of sediments at this reef. So, but you kind of see that there's a lot of dictyota um, in this quadrat. Now, two months after, you can see that the reef is much brighter, uh, the substrate much cleaner. Uh, you can see that there's Christos uh, coralline algae. Um, so diadema does their job. Um, they clean the substrate. Uh, this is just now, uh, I finished the we finished the monitoring in um, Fajardo at the two sites, uh, Cayo Largo and Palomino. Um, so here are some pictures. Um, I didn't put the two months in, but it's pretty much similar to the one month. So before diadema was placed, uh, you can see dictyota. But what's tricky on the East Coast is that a lot of times um, algae will overgrow Remy Crusta. So if you just look at it at a glance, you would think that it's dictyota, but under that dictyota, there's Remy Crusta. So you see that there's you see that there's dictyota. Um, and so in two weeks, uh, the diadema removed the dictyota and there's still some Rami Crusta and Pacinellids under the dictyota. Um, and then two weeks later, the diadema removed all of the Rami Crusta and in two months also did that. So um, here's a top view of one of the corrals that we placed diadema in. You can see that there is a lot of dictyota, but again, under that dictyota, there's Rami Crusta. Um, and two months after, you can see how clean the substrate is. You could even see the coral skeleton um, inside this corral. At Palomino, uh, the grazing of a diadema was uh, a little bit slower. I think it was the conditions. Uh, Palomino is uh, much more exposed. Uh, it's a high energetic area. Uh, so the diadema were kind of like holding on for their lives because there's a couple big swells um, after we, we put them on this reef. 
Um, but they significantly decrease the algae at this reef. You can see um, Dictyota on top of Rami Crusta. Uh, two weeks later, can't really see a difference. A little, not so much Dictyota, but one month and then two months, um, the substrate's pretty clean. Uh, here's a top view of one of the corals. You can see um, kind of Dictyota, but a lot of Rami Crusta. And you can see how well uh, the di diadema ate uh, the Rami Crusta. So conclusions, um, diadema are effective in reducing fleshy algae. Uh, also, uh, like Dictyota, they also can reduce turf with sediment, which is a nuisance to coral sediment and recruitment. And also Rami Crusta. Um, we don't know if Rami Crusta is um, a, a cue or a, a suitable substrate for corals to settle. So um, most likely not if they're overgrowing, killing coral uh, adult um, coral tissue. Um, so it, when we when we're thinking about restoration, we really have to um, before we put out any corals, we really have to um, think of how to reduce herbivores, whether it's reducing nutrients coming off land or increasing herbivores. And one way to do this, as you can see in this presentation, is um, increasing the abundance of sea urchins, especially like, uh, especially diadema. Um, so urchins can be used to clean uh, the reef before coral, before restocking any or outplanting any corals. And there is a master student, Noel Carrea. Um, he is now looking at part of his master thesis to see if diadema um, improve the survivorship and growth of coral outplants. So hopefully in, in the next year or so, we'll um, know the results of that study. So again, the study, this study uh, highlights the importance of herbivores in improving uh, the conditions on coral reefs in Puerto Rico and most likely um, in other parts of the Caribbean. So I wanna briefly just touch on the other project that we have started in the lab, um, and this is looking at alternative um, herbivores. So diadema are great, but there's some disadvantages to just uh, restoring diadema. Um, diadema, um, like at deeper reefs, usually there are a lot of triggerfish, and triggerfish are one of the main predators for diadema. So it might not be ideal to restore diadema to deeper reefs. Um, so we have to think of all other sea urchin alternatives or other alternative herbivores like crabs um, to restock to the different habitats. So we're looking at two different approaches um, to restocking two different species of sea urchins. So Echinometra viridis, um, this is a rock urchin. Uh, we will be uh, removing some of the species from a shallow reef that has high, really high abundance. Actually, they are too much. They're probably by eroding the reef. And we're going to be moving them to uh, two shelf edge reefs in La Perguera. So that will be happening hopefully in April. I don't have the results of that. But another approach that we're taking is that we are larval rearing uh, Trypneustes ventricosis. This is the West Indian sea egg. So we are not like Diadema Project. The Diadema Project, I am collecting settlers. With the Trypneustes project, what we're doing is that we are, a lot, we are rearing the entire life cycle in lab. So how we do this? Um, well, we, we had to develop a small larval hatchery. And what we did was we uh, developed uh, a filter system because the water has to be really clean. Uh, water goes through multiple filters, uh, mechanical filters, and then a one micron uh, sack and then UV light. Um, we also need larval tanks, uh, conical larval tanks to keep the larvae afloat. Um, and so we've developed this and this is all at the Department of Marine Science. The larval rearing is a much more intensive process than just collecting settlers um, because you just don't throw the larvae in the larval tanks. You have to change water every day, um, change, change actual tanks every three days, but you have to feed the larvae every single day. And since they are so small, um, you need to feed them microalgae. And right now we're growing two species of microalgae in lab, Isochrysis and Kytoceras. And they're fed every single day, 
and the amount that they're fed is dependent on the density of larvae in the tanks. So before we, so the first step of this is collecting a couple of adults and getting them to spawn. Um, we collect their eggs and the eggs are usually bright, bright orange um, color. And then we pipette the sperm um, and place the sperm in a test tube and, and store that on ice until we get back to the lab. Once we're back in the lab, we dilute the sperm and then we introduce the sperm to the eggs. And right away, uh, we'll know if the eggs have been fertilized because they show this membrane. Um, and once the eggs are fertilized, we then place them in a, a container that's about four liters, um, a, four, a four liter container. Um, so we, uh, we place a thin layer of fertilized eggs in this container and fill it with filtered seawater. And we stir that every, you know, every couple minutes or every, you know, 10 minutes or so um, until we go home. And then the next day, um, if we know that the eggs are fertilized or on their way of becoming um, a larvae is that they're suspended in the water column um, like this video. So you can see all um, the fertilized eggs suspended in the water column. So this process is really cool um, because you get to see the changes um, throughout their planktonic stage. Uh, so here's some pictures of the next day when the eggs are, are fertilized fertilized and have metamorphosed. Um, so they go through the different cell divisions. Um, and the picture to the right is actually uh, a picture of uh, an egg in gastrulation. And then uh, every day they pretty much change. Um, so you see that the day two, uh, they start forming their prism, prism shape. Um, this is a typical shape of an, uh, a, a kind of a sea urchin larvae. Um, but then they start growing arms, uh, their arms get longer, their stomachs start to get bigger, and you can see that they're brown. So that means that they're eating the microalgae. Um, by day 10, they start uh, developing their rudiments. So that's their body as a sea urchin. Um, and then by day, um, 17, um, you can, no, sorry, by day 18, you could start seeing little signs of pedicellaria and pedicellaria is just modified tube feet. Um, so sea urchins, if you ever pick up like a trip noosties, um, they'll stick to you and how they're sticking to you is by these two feet. Um, so pedicellaria is a modified two feet where it just has claws at the end. I um, mean, you could see this in day 21 uh, you could kind of see the claw at the end um, of the pedicellaria. Uh, so by day 25, um, some signs that they're ready to possibly be placed in the settlement tank um, is that they are developed, they have multiple pedicellaria and they are developing two feet. So, and they're a size of about 350 microns, so really small. Um, so if the majority of the larvae are showing all these signs, that uh, gives us um, warning that we need to prepare to then transfer them to the settlement tank. So by day 26 of this last larval run, they were ready to be placed in the settlement tank. So um, we did a small pilot study during our first larval run um, of actually looking at what could be some of the cues. So there, there are cues needed for all marine organisms in the, that have a planktonic stage. And these cues um, are specific to the specific organism. Um, for for trypneustes, what we found was that ulva and plates that had CCA, crystals coralline algae, and a thin layer of biofilm those were the cues. So those cues tell the, the larvae, okay, it's time to change into a small urchin. Um, we also played around with Thalassia, but the cue was not there. And actually there's a master student that will be doing uh, Hunter. He will be looking at the specific cues um, for his thesis. Um, 
So we should have a better understanding. But from our first pilot study, we knew that ulva, which is a sea, green sea lettuce, and the CCA plates uh, were uh, cues that we can have the larvae then transform to uh, a small settler. Um, so this last larval run, we placed about 850, 875 larvae in the ulva tanks and about 1,000 in the settler uh, in the CCA, um, in the tank with the CCA. And with the ulva, um, we saw right away that they settled. Um, so here is a picture of some of the small settlers. But we, what's cool about this, this small study is that ulva is a cue for them to settle. But what we found was ulva um, that the settlers grew very slowly with ulva and um, they died, they eventually died. So possibly ulva is not the optimal um, consistency of algae because they're still developing their mouth parts. So maybe they can't digest ulva as well as um, say the biofilm or um, maybe some of the CCA on the plates. Um, here are some of the pictures of some of the settlers and you can see how small they are um, and their growth again was a lot slower than in the CCA uh, on the CCA plates and it was really hard at first to uh, identify any settlers on the CCA plates um, because of their color and their size they're light brown diadema are red so it it's easy to uh, to ID them but trypneustes their color is like a little bit like light brown to green but with the CCA, um, after about 30 days, you could start seeing them pop up even a little bit less than 30 days. Um, so here's a picture of a 30 day old uh, diade uh, trypneustes, sorry. So close to 0.4 mill millimeters in test diameter. And then 45, they're growing, they're bigger than a millimeter. Um, and when they're bigger than a millimeter, we then move them to a tank with ulva. Um, because they can now eat ulva, they have a well-formed um, mouth parts. Um, so here's a picture of one of the trypneustes. Right now we have 108 trypneustes, so this is pretty good. Um, this is a survivorship of about 5%, 5.6% um, from spawn to settlers. Um, that might seem low, but for a survivor, for rec in the, in the popul natural population, um, in the field, uh, they've estimated the survivorship of settlement of settlement be of settlement to be less than 0.01%. Um, so, um, and in aquaculture, that is pretty high, five percent. So, we are still building the protocol, and hopefully, this is small scale, but we hope to um, uh, build. Uh, build up and uh, do this larval rearing at a larger scale. So these projects could not be um, could not be possible with the help of um, technicians uh, like Manuel Omeda, um, Katie Flynn, um, Milton Carlo, everyone, Orlando Espinosa, um, and all the students that you see in this picture. Um, they've helped this this project um, through its years and uh, it could not be possible without them. Also, um, both of these projects are funded by NOAA and also um, Recursos Naturales. Um, and here's my contact information, our website, Isar Caribe. Uh, right now it's in the process of um, being built again, but you can come and check us out. Uh, contact me if you have any questions and I will be um, happy to help in any way I can. Thank you. Un millón de gracias, Stacy. Esta charla estuvo espectacular. Aprendí, aprendí un montón, de verdad. So, gracias, gracias por eso. Eh, hay muchas preguntas en el chat, así que yo creo que podemos comenzar con eso rapidito. Este, Chelsea, Chelsea and Evan, you had a lot of questions. Thank you for being here, by the way, so, uh, Chelsea and Evan. Um, you had a lot of questions. I don't know if you guys want to open your mic or like you can turn on your camera and just like we can talk it out. So uh, I'm going to leave our mic off because we're trying to get Jack ready for bed. So, <laughs> and he's quite talkative. 
but um yeah but i put the questions in the chat would it be possible to maybe like read them off from there and like we'll just kind of listen <laughs> right. no problem um okay so the first question was is there anywhere that ramik rusta is not found around the island yeah so well it's now kind of everywhere um in our permanent transects um but some of the places that we haven't found Rami Crusta is actually in Cabo Rojo. And it, what I've noticed that Rami Crusta does not like when the reef has a fine veneer of sediment on it. So reefs like close to the shore, like Resuellos in Cabo Rojo, like off of Combate, um, I don't see Rami Crusta at that reef. Also uh, other reefs off of Cabo Rojo um, that has a little bit of sediment on the reef um i don't see rami crusta there but actually it wasn't in tres palmas now it's in tres palmas um and especially in the shallow i believe i would have to look at the report from last time but we did see a significant increase i believe in rami crusta in tres palmas I, actually in desecheo i believe we don't see it in desecheo um right now so but it's definitely um dominant on the East Coast um, and it's kind of making its way to the Southwest Coast, so. Thank you. Um, next question from Chelsea and Evan as well. Has there been a diet study with urchins to see specifically what they eat? Like if they prefer Rami Grusa over, over, over other things? There was a study of their diet a long time ago of just like what they eat. Um, there hasn't been a study to see what they prefer to eat. Um, my personal observations, they do have a preference. Um, they will go to Acanthopera first. They love Acanthopera laurentia. Um, they really like ulva. Um, and they will eat Dictyota and Chytomorpha last. Um, so they do have a preference, what we've seen in our tanks. Um, they will eat it, it's just not their favorite. Um, I haven't really done that with Rami Crusta um, because we don't have easy access to um, big chunks of Rami Crusta like what we see on the East Coast, um, but that would be a pretty cool study uh, for some student. <laughs> Um, so, la próxima pregunta, Jaime preguntó, like the coral, coral nurseries, pero no sé a qué se refería en el momento. No sé si quiere eh, abrir tu micrófono, Jaime. Sí, era lo de cuando se estaba criando los erizos. If is, they are going to be like the nurseries, the same, the same method. They use, uh, hacen como unos ponds, unas piscinitas, y los crían ahí adentro. Y somos the same system. Sí, well, tenemos para los corales hay un sistema diferente, pero en de, de tanques con corales hay diadema, pero no mucho porque um, para los corales no uh, queremos uh, algas en los tanques. So para para de erizos Queremos poner o tenemos que poner algas en los tanques. So es de razón okay. tenemos sistemas aparte porque de, de tanques de coral necesitan estar muy limpia. No, no puede you. You know, mm -hmm. llenar con algas y, y eso. So si hay, different, hay ahora un sistema para los corales y sistemas para de diadema y otro sistema para de tripnustis. So hay, hay tres sistemas diferentes en el Departamento de Ciencias Marinas. Perfect, thank you very much. Sí, usamos, you know, okay. like en los tanques de coral, usamos um, herbivoros como erizos, like diadema y canametra y um, surgeon fish um, para mantener de, de abundancia de algas adentro de los tanques, pero es not para crecer, you know, estos organismos, solamente de corales. You? 
Eh, antes de seguir a la próxima pregunta, eh, puse en el chat un Google Form para la evaluación de las charlas para que nos ayuden a, a ver qué, más puede, qué otros temas podemos traerle y eso. Pero van a ver el enlace ahí en el chat. Entonces, próxima pregunta, tenemos Chelsea Evan. How well do they handle the transit to the east? Um, yeah, I think they're talking about the urchins. Uh, so this last time they did very well. Um, the first time we used containers, the big black containers, and I think that just created um, a wave machine. Um, this time we used those big blue bins and they did really, really well. Um, they were like in perfect condition when we moved them over. Um, we had, thanks to Manuel and um, some other students and Katie, uh, we arrived at Megaya's really early in the morning. Manuel arrived at 4.30 in the morning um, and we moved the diadema to the, the containers and then we took them in van uh, to the East Coast. Uh, so yeah, it worked out really well uh, this time around. Also, we, we just took uh, 4,000, about 4,000 corals to the East Coast and that also, the corals did really well um, in containers, so. Thank you. So next question is from Debbie Payton. What happens when the, the algae have done such a good job that there is not enough algae to support the population on the reef? Do they move somewhere else, die off, or start eating something else? Um, and I meant so, to say when the okay. diadoma have done such a good job, not, not the algae eating itself, sorry. Oh yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I understood it. Um, okay, yeah, so we, we actually, you know, like uh, when we do restoration on East Coast, and since they love to escape the corrals, a lot of times we put tops on the corrals for like a month. And that happened this time around um, just to keep them in there. And they ate all the algae. So we had to remove the tops. Um, so they will look for um, another area to eat. So usually th what they do is then they spread out and they slowly move to other areas with algae. If they are constrained, uh, they will eat other things if they run up out of algae. I've seen them eat um, a trididium. Uh, it's a uh, encrusting uh, tunicate. Um, it could over also overgrow and compete against corals. And also um, this time around, they ate a sponge dictionella um, is also a space competitor. Um, where I've never seen them eat sponges before. Um, so they will target other organisms if they're confined in a space. Um, but they, usually they will go to different areas um, if they run out of food. Thanks. Okay. So Chelsea and Evan, could it be possible to create movable corals to target specific areas on the reef? For for urchins to eat ramicrusta, and, and is that result ephemeral in the longer term? Um, it can be possible, but the corrals are just a really big pain uh, to install and to maintain. Um, they're usually made of metal and with you know salt water, they start corroding. Um, so ideally, uh, it's not great to use corrals. Um, what we found this time around, and I think really helped is that the urchins that we released on the reef, we put them in groups of 30 to 40 urchins. So for the first month, they were, well, first two weeks, they were in shock mode. They didn't move at all, um, but they stayed all together. And then we started noticing them slowly dispersed. So they didn't all take off at the same time, like they usually did in previous uh, restoration efforts. This time around, I think because they had protection in numbers, they 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 stayed in that area. So I think that's the way to go is to put, you know, larger groups of urchins together and let them um, leave the group when they're ready to, um, not to force them, <laughs> so. Well, cool. thank you, Stacy. You're welcome. Tenemos una pregunta de Marta. ¿Es posible cambiar la dieta de los erizos una, en una área específica para la etapa larvaria y otra para cuando están ya con metamorfosis? 
sí es posible um, uh, porque de dieta de um, de larva y cuando eh, ellos son asentamientos son diferentes pero durante la etapa de larva es posible puede cambiar de dieta no sé si es buena um, pero si hay otro especies de alga de ellos les gustan es posible puede cambiar durante de la etapa de, de larva pero ellos tienen diferentes dietas entre de, de etapa de larva y de asentamiento. So cuando ellos están asentamientos o settlers, ellos comen alga diferente. No son microalgas, son um, like fleshy, uh, kind of tiny algae. Pasiles um, son microalgas, no sé de especies de algas, pero no son microalgas como eh, en, en los tanques de, de larvas. No sé si contesté la pregunta correcta. No sé si Marta quisiera comentar alguna otra pregunta, está clara o... Si no, pues esa es la última pregunta que tenemos. ¿Alguien más tiene otra pregunta? Mira, Marta escribió, sí, gracias. Eso podría evitar la muerte para los del 5%. Ah, sí. Yo creo de para evitar uh, la muerte o you know, um, aumentar o well, disminuir de, de muerte, um, de 5% es posible um, like, crecer las larvas a más tiempo, o so más días. So posible 26 días um, no es suficiente para las larvas. So posible 27 días o 28 días es un día um, uh, ideal para transferirlos a los tanques de asentamiento. Um, es, es fácil una razón para aumentar um, de sobrevivencia de asentamientos. Pero buena pregunta. Ok, ¿alguien más tiene alguna otra pregunta, comentario que le quieran hacer a, a Stacy antes de culminar? Pueden abrir su micrófono, pueden escribir por el, por el chat. Si quiere, puede contactar, contactarme um, con mi email o um, vía Facebook. Um, no estoy en Facebook, pero Easter está en Facebook. Um, si tiene preguntas o dudas. Sí, exacto. ¿Cuáles cuál es, es son los, o sea, cómo se llaman en Instagram, Facebook y eso? ¿Y ser así mismo? Sí, y ser Caribe. Sí. Y ser Caribe. En Instagram, Twitter um, uh -huh. y Facebook. Sí. Es como okay. escribe en el website, más o menos. Sí. Yeah. Bueno, lo voy a escribir aquí en el chat. Ser Caribe. Ahí lo pueden buscar. Pues sí. con eso podemos terminar entonces. Muchas gracias, Stacy, de verdad. Este, esta charla estuvo gracias. espectacular. Este, quiero darle las gracias también a, a, pues, a los participantes por, por estar presente hoy. Y nada, seguiremos en la próxima. Saben que pueden seguir la página de Facebook, Instagram, este, YouTube de Amando Océano y vamos a seguir dando la charla a ustedes. Y si ustedes siguen asistiendo. <ríe> Así que gracias mil a todos y buenas noches. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Bye, gracias. Excelente charla. Gracias, buenas noches. Ahora también acá. Buenas noches.